Friends, hello and welcome to yet another episode of The Legal Breakdown. Today we're going to continue part three in our series about bankruptcy. And so let's go back, let's rehash what we've covered in parts one and part two, and then we're going to talk today in part three where we go from there. So Back in episode one, we talked about the four things you need to consider when weighing your options as opposed to chapter seven, first chapter 13. These are the two most commonly used chapters of bankruptcy by individual consumers like yourself. So what are those four things we're gonna go over very quickly? Time between filing a prior bankruptcies, what's known as the means test, or in other words, your total household income, the sheer differences in the nature of chapter seven versus chapter 13. And then also we talked about what's known as exempt property. Okay, in our part two episode, we then began to discuss the timeline of preparing to file a bankruptcy, that overall you're gonna work on three things to get into a position to file a case. Number one, that's all the information to do your case correctly. Number two, that's going to be taking a consumer credit counseling course. And number three is paying for the case, whether you're filing on your own and you have to pay the court filing fees of 335 for a chapter seven or 310 for a chapter 13, or whether that's paying for an attorney. But that leads us up to then the point of filing. Now we're going to work under the assumption we've got a bankruptcy on the books, we've got a case number, what comes next? So today's episode assumes that you've had the ability to watch episodes one and two related to bankruptcy. If not, you can access all that information through our website at sansonehowell.com. That's S-A-N-S-O-N-E-H-O-W ell.com. Every episode of The Legal Breakdown is archived. It can be accessed through our Facebook page, through youtube.com, and the audio portion is turned into a podcast, which can be listened to on Google Play, Spotify, or the Apple iTunes directory. So if you ever want to listen to any of our prior episodes, those are all available. Remember, we're streaming live on Facebook Live, as well as our host parent station KTLV 1220 AM. In addition, you can listen to KTLV 1220 AM through the TuneIn radio app. And so if you're ever wanting to listen to this live on the radio, maybe you don't have access to Facebook, maybe you're outside of the area for the terrestrial broadcast for 1220 AM, you can always listen on TuneIn radio and that would be available. So let's jump right in today. Your case has been filed. Within the first 24 hours, you should be able to find out what your court date is, when you need to go to court. And that's gonna be known as a 341 meeting of creditors. And we'll talk in a bit what that meeting of creditors entails. But know that you're gonna know the next day after you file your case. And by law, in a chapter seven, it must occur between 21 and 40 days after the date of filing and 21 and 50 days after the date of filing in a chapter 13. But notice that the consistent thing is you will have at least three weeks to make arrangements. And it's important you do, because there's virtually no excuse for missing it. You need to appear at that meeting of creditors. It doesn't matter. Uh, you can't say, well, I had pre-existing arrangements to go out of town. I've, you know, I, I got to work. All those things are going to fall on relatively deaf ears. If you know you've got travel for personal or for work, Plan accordingly when you file the case. If, uh, if you've got other things going on, you need to take that into consideration because you need to go to that meeting of creditors. Failure to attend will be grounds to dismiss the case. Okay, so we're gonna go to the meeting of creditors, but we know we've got three weeks to make those arrangements. After that first 24 hours, when you know when that court date is, the next thing that you should be thinking about working on is the debtor education management course. What's that? Well, we talked back in part two, and I refreshed just a moment ago, that before you file, you have to take a class known as consumer credit counseling. This is the second step. There's no third, good news. You don't have to keep doing classes over and over, but you need to take a second financial management, financial education course. It's required by law, and it was a change that came about in the 2005 amendments to the bankruptcy code that was known as BAPSIPA, or the Bankruptcy Abuse and Consumer Protection Act. 
The second course is going to be very similar to the first you had to take. It's going to take approximately two to two and a half hours. You can take that either online, over the phone, or locally in person. The choice is up to you. I want to pause for just a moment to remind all of our viewers and listeners that I am happy to answer questions live. You can ask questions through the Facebook live feed and submit these through social media. In addition, you're more than welcome to call in. The phone number to call us live at any time is 405-347-7238. I'll read that one more time in case you're driving, maybe you're at home, you didn't have a piece of paper and a pen. If you'd like to ask me questions live on the radio, 405 405- Three four seven seven two three eight. Okay, so we've determined you're going to file the case. We're going to know when we're going to go to court together. Then we're going to do this course that has to be taken. Well, when do you have to do that course? Technically, it's only required to obtain your discharge. So if we're talking about a Chapter 13, that could be as much as five years in the future. If you're talking about a Chapter 7, that's going to be 60 days after that 341 meeting of creditors. But with that said, there's no reason to wait. If you don't get it done, you're going to start to get nasty grams from the court. It could delay your ability to obtain discharge, and eventually they can actually close the case without obtaining discharge, meaning you went through all this process, you may have spent a lot of money on an attorney, and you didn't even get the benefit that you were seeking of obtaining a bankruptcy discharge. So you don't want to do that over failure to just get a simple certificate that says you took a class. But it happens. It's never happened to me because we very diligently, you know, have our clients do these things, but it does happen because people move, they don't update their counsel with what their phone number is or their mailing address, they don't tell the court, they don't realize they haven't done everything they need to do. So my recommendation to you, the listener, especially if you're considering filing bankruptcy on your own, you decide to prepare the documents and you file this pro se, take the class in the first three weeks. Take it before you go to court. That way you know it's done. That way you don't have to worry about this silly thing holding you up from obtaining the relief that you so desperately want to get your fresh financial start. Okay. Next step is going to that meeting of creditors. Now, you need to be prepared for that. You want to make sure that you've done everything beforehand that's going to be necessary. Number one, we need a valid photo ID. That to get in the building, the United States Marshal Service is going to want you to have a current valid copy of a photo ID. It could be a driver's license. It could be a military ID card. It could be a state ID card. One way or other, have valid photo ID. And you also need current proof of Social Security. Now, I touched in depth on this when we were talking about the necessary documents for your case back in Episode 2. But I'm going to reiterate again just because it's very important. We mentioned you should make sure you have these things. We mentioned that you need to have copies of these things. You cannot conduct the hearing, that 341 meeting of creditors, without a valid proof of Social Security. They need to be able to compare the documents you've filed to some form of identification. It's important to remember what will work. It can't be something you've prepared on your own. So a tax form, you could have written whatever you want at the top. The trustee cannot accept that. So it could be a Social Security card. It could be a tax transcript or wage transcript you've obtained back from the Internal Revenue Service. It could be a 1099 or a W-2 that's been issued to you by an employer. But whatever it is, make sure you have that. So come prepared. You're going to have W-2s. Maybe 1099, maybe a Social Security card, but we're going to have proof of Social Security, proof of driver's license to get in the building. Give yourself ample time to arrive on time. In the Western District of Oklahoma, it's in Oklahoma City, it's downtown. Not everyone is used to going to downtown. They don't know where to park. So there's no reason to wait to the last minute. If anything, go down there beforehand. You can always scout out a day or two before where the court is, but make sure you leave yourself time to be able to park, to get in the building, Uh, and and not be stressed out. You don't want to be arriving at the last minute. You don't want your attorney calling you and saying, where are you? Those kinds of things. Okay. Now, it's worth pointing out, make sure you know which court you're going to and go to the correct courthouse. We live in a big city. It's the capital for our state. There's a lot of different courts. If you just Google courts or you look, you know, at some other map, you're going to find out we've got Oklahoma City Municipal Court. You've got Oklahoma County District Court. 
in Oklahoma City is the, is the Oklahoma Supreme Court. There is the federal court where criminal and civil cases are tried on 4th Street. There's the bankruptcy court. Heck, we've got Social Security courts, we've got tax courts, we've got workers' compensation courts. The point is, you're going to the bankruptcy court. They are their own place. Make sure you go there. That it's, you know, it occurs time to time where someone says, hey, I'm here, and you find out maybe they're at, say, the district court. If you've ever had a criminal case or a divorce, something like that, you're not going to the same place. So don't just go out of habit or think you know where you're going. If you haven't had a bankruptcy before, you don't know where this courthouse is. So go to the right place, arrive early, have the documents to get in the building. Okay, now we're there. Now we're at the meeting of creditors. In addition to your driver's license and your social security card, you're going to want to make sure you bring any other documents that the trustee may have advised you is necessary or your attorney may have advised you to bring. Some of those things would be additional bank statements. And if you think about it, bank statements only come out at certain intervals. Most banks work on a monthly rotation. So if you file your case on, say, February the 20th today, the last bank statement you have is going to cover January, but it's not going to cover all the way up through the date of filing. It's going to stop at some point, and there's going to be a gap after the end of that bank statement up to where, you know, when you filed your bankruptcy. Well, the trustees are required to be able to review and examine all your financial conduct pre-petition before you filed, and that's going to run all the way up to that date of filing. So hopefully, in the time between when you filed and when you go to court, you will have received those supplemental bank statements. If you haven't already provided them to the trustee or provided them to your attorney to provide to the trustee, this is the time to do that. Bring those with you to the courthouse. That way you can give those to the trustee. They can review everything necessary so that they've seen the documents they want to see. I'll also stress at this time of year, if you haven't done your 2018 taxes, you're going to ultimately be required to do those in order to close your case and receive a discharge. They're important because it's an obligation and the trustee won't have any way of knowing if, number one, you met that obligation to the government of filing a return, and they also won't have any way of knowing what, if any, refund you might have coming and whether or not it might be property of the bankruptcy estate. So. Make sure you file your 2018 taxes timely. I realize that officially you don't have to file those until April the 15th. And if you asked for an extension, you can make that October the 15th. But I can guarantee you that the trustee won't give you until October the 15th in rare or maybe if you've got a complex business case or some other extenuating factors. But the vast majority of the time, there's no reason to wait. Just go ahead and get those taxes done. Okay, so we've showed up. What can we expect? What is going to happen at this 341 meeting of creditors? Well, it obviously exists so that your creditors can ask you questions. They can examine you. But the truth is that in the vast majority of individual consumer cases, they're a little more of you know, the mechanical and they're just a process we're required to do than anything that you need to be intimidating by. The likelihood that a creditor actually appears and asks you questions is very remote. The majority of cases, there is no one but the trustee yourself and possibly if you have counsel, your counsel. But creditors don't appear with great regularity. So don't be nervous. In addition, depending on, you know, who your counsel is, you may have already been given a list of the types of questions to expect, to anticipate. If not, these things are readily available. You can actually go right now and search online of questions to ask at a 341 meeting of creditors. We provide those to our clients so that they know what to expect, so there's no apprehension and no fear. Some of the things you can expect to be asked, did you read and prepare all the documents um, either with your attorney or on your own before you signed them? Is the signature your own? Are they true and correct? Are there any errors or omissions to bring to the trustee's attention at this time? Did these documents conclude all information about all of your assets? And do they include information about all of your debts? You can see that really we're just trying to make sure that everything's accurate, that we haven't had a fraud, that there's not been something left out. They're going to ask if you owe a domestic support obligation. They're going to ask if you've read a piece of paper known as the bankruptcy information sheet. It's available at the courthouse. If you hadn't already seen it before now, that's still opportunity to see it and review it before the meeting of creditors. Again, if you are with counsel, they'll know that. If you file on your own, 
you'll want to look up the bankruptcy information sheet and review it before you get to court and at the very last opportunity review it there at the court. Questions are going to be asked related to property transfer. Have you given away or sold anything in the preceding year before your case? Have you had any losses? Are you holding property belonging to anybody else? Does anyone holding property belong to you? Do you think you have a claim against anyone or any business, which means do you have the right to sue anybody for any reason? Are you involved in any lawsuits where you could win money? Again, all these questions are just designed to make sure that the documents filed in your bankruptcy are correct. That is the types of things you can expect right here while we were talking. I just shared with you all those questions. Notice it did not take very long. In total, you can expect to be in front of a bankruptcy trustee in a Chapter 7 or a Chapter 13 case for only about five to seven minutes. Frankly, if it's longer than that, one of two things has happened. It's a complex case, and therefore you probably have already consulted with counsel and are not likely to do this on your own. Or something's gone off the rails, meaning you or your counsel have screwed something up, you've left something out, we got questions coming from the trustee we didn't anticipate. Truthfully, those are the only two reasons it's going to take much longer than about seven minutes, is that something's screwed up, or this isn't the normal individual case. And like I said, don't, don't expect to have creditors appear. It's unlikely they're going to appear. Now, up until now, the path for Chapter 7 and Chapter 13 have been very similar in what we've been speaking to, that you don't have any distinction other than in Chapter 13 you need to be making your plan payments. Here's where they're going to begin to depart from each other, and so now I'm going to start speaking to them separately. We're going to go down the path of Chapter 7, and then we're going to come back to speaking to Chapter 13. So with a Chapter 7 at this point, Ideally, that meeting of creditors is concluded, meaning the trustee doesn't require you or your counsel to come back. They've heard and seen everything they want to see. You're done. You're now in a 60-day window where creditors have the right to object to discharge. What does that mean? What it means is just because you prepare and file a bankruptcy obviously doesn't mean that someone might disagree with you on whether or not you get to wipe out a particular debt. We have, we have a process, we have due process to make determinations on those things. People can argue over it. This is the correct time period for those arguments to be raised. Broadly speaking, there's two sections of law in a Chapter 7 that are going to be relevant to objections to discharge. We're going to talk about 523 actions, and those are called that because they appear in the law at United States Code Title 11, Section 523. And we're going to talk about 727 actions, which are Title 11, United States Code 727. So 523s and 727s. A 727 is going to occur because you have somehow lied or committed fraud or perjury as part of your bankruptcy case. It's not about conduct you've done in the past. It's not about the way you obtained the money. It is that you did not, you weren't honest when you filled out all the paperwork. You failed to disclose information. You've committed bad faith. You've committed fraud. A 727 action is going to bar you from receiving discharge for the whole case. It denies you discharge on all debts. So it's obviously something you do not want. Typically, those come from the United States trustees program or your trustee. They're not usually filed by individual creditors themselves. It's possible they've got the right to, but don't expect that. Okay, so the only reason you're going to receive a 727 action is if you haven't listened to anything I've said in part one, two, or three of this series, or you and your attorney completely mess up and basically commit criminal perjury. So 727, very bad, knock on wood, not one of my clients has ever had anything like that even alleged, and I hope that you never do either. Now let's talk about 523 actions. A 523 action is related to the debt itself. They're not going to be all-encompassing, they're going to be about specific actions and specific debts. And those are going to be somehow the way either you obtained the debt or the nature of the debt. So you received a loan and the bank asked you to list all of your assets and all of your obligations, all your debts. You told them you own property, you don't, that was fraudulent. You told them that you don't have a loan and you actually do. Whether it's in writing, whether it's oral, there's different sections for these things, but ultimately a 523 is, in a nutshell, saying 
we loaned money to someone and we wouldn't have done it if we knew all the facts or under the circumstances were revealed to us. Therefore, they shouldn't be able to discharge that debt. So those have to occur in the 60-day window. They have to be filed and started in the 60-day window after that 341 meeting of creditors, the first appearance. If your meeting of creditors is, con is continued for some reason, it doesn't change the 60-day window for objections to discharge. Now, a creditor could file a motion and ask to extend the window for objections to discharge, but that's only going to happen if they already know they're going to file something. That, that only happens if we're doing our research, we're drafting up a case, and we fully plan to bring action against you, at which point you need to get very competent and very experienced bankruptcy counsel because you're heading into some pretty... Uh, tough waters of litigation. But I want to say this very, very uh, strongly for everyone watching and listening. These are not a reason to be afraid. They're not a reason to all of a sudden be paranoid and think I'm not going to have a successful bankruptcy. These types of cases, 523s especially, but also 727s, are complex. They are lengthy. And in the world of attorneys, that means they are expensive. They're expensive to defend and they're expensive to prosecute. Banks don't historically look at these types of things on small amounts of money and controversy. Credit card companies, for example, their business model is making money on high interest rates. For everybody who doesn't pay the credit card, someone is paying 28% interest. If you went online and you applied for a credit card and you make $40,000 a year and you told them you make 60, it's true, you shouldn't have done that. It's true, it's not legal. But don't lose sleep at night thinking, man, the credit card company is going to file a 523 action against me. I'm probably not going to be able to discharge this debt. Admittedly, they could, but I've never seen one do it ever. In fact, We've never handled a 523 action that wasn't more than six figures, just because of the complex nature of the scope of those. You see them in business-related cases, small business, those types of things. Okay. We've got about five minutes left in the show, so I want to continue talking about Chapter 7 timeline. We may not make it today to the Chapter 13 timeline, and that's okay. We can always pick it up in a future session. Once that time period has expired on the 60-day window for creditors to object to discharge, the court will administratively process and issue your discharge. That is good. That is the date that, in large part, you've been wanting and caring about. You, your debts are now wiped out. Uh, not necessarily all of them. If you owe taxes or child support, domestic support, some of those things might survive. But the, the debts you cared about, the credit cards, the medical bills, the loans, have been discharged. And the discharge date is the date that's reported on credit. It's the date that reflects your eligibility to future home buying. It's the date that you may have to disclose if you ever um, you know, go to get bonded or insured or some of those things. Um, it's not the date that is applicable to filing future bankruptcy cases. That is going to be the date of filing. But the discharge date is what a lot of lending institutions and credit tends to care about. So good news, you've reached the finish line, sort of. I say sort of because it's important to realize that bankruptcy, Chapter 7, sort of have two paths. They have the asset administration, and then they also have you and the process through the courts and the discharge. Your case may not be closed. It depends on whether your Chapter 7 is an asset or a no-asset case, and those that were able to tune in when we talked about our first and second episodes will know what I'm speaking to. But very briefly, we talked about exemptions and exempt property back in part one of our bankruptcy series. If your case is a no-asset, it means the trustee did not take any property from you and they're not administering any property. That means that the case will be closed very promptly after you receive discharge because there's nothing else for the trustee to do. They will have filed a motion and or, or they will have filed their report of no distribution and they will be asked to be let out of the case, that they're going to say, we're done. On the other hand, if there was non-exempt property that was not abandoned by the trustee and then therefore by law they are have a, a, a fiduciary duty to administer that on behalf of the unsecured creditors, they're going to need to do so. The time it takes to administer an estate can vary greatly based on the complexity. It 
depends on what assets are turned over. If you turn over something like a motor vehicle, that's very easy. We take it to auction, we sell it, we've liquidated it, we have the money, and we divvy it up to creditors. Maybe you have mineral rights in three different states. Well, that's going to be a lot harder. We're going to have to put those up for auction. We're going to have to find buyers. It just depends on what in that Chapter 7 were the assets. But so just be aware that your case may not be closed. There may still be things for the trustee to be doing. But usually it does not affect the debtor. That you can move along with life. We already talked about the fact that the discharge dates, what's going to be on your credit. And so it may be out of sight and out of mind. You may not even be aware that all this is going on because you likely already turned over what you had to turn over. Let's say, for example, you had a portion of a tax refund that was non-exempt. That's liquid assets. That's the easiest thing possible to administer because it's just money. You gave that money to the trustee at some point in time. You obtained your discharge and you moved on with life. You may not even be aware that your case is still open and there's still a process to divvy all that up to the creditors. And so I just say that to be aware that even if that's occurring, it, it doesn't mean that you can't move forward no matter how long it takes to continue with that case. Okay. We only have two minutes left in today's episode, so we're going to very briefly touch on Chapter 13, and then that's going to set us up in a perfect segue for our next episode when we reach Part 4 of this ongoing series talking about bankruptcy. We touched on the fact that the initial timeline from day zero of filing up to the meeting of creditors is almost identical in Chapter 7 versus Chapter 13 cases. The one difference that I want to stress very greatly, and I said it already, but I want to stress it again, is you've got to make plan payments. A Chapter 13 is reorganization. No matter what, you're going to be paying something to a Chapter 13 trustee. You cannot get confirmed on a plan if you are not current on those payments. And so before the meeting of creditors, you don't get a hurry up and wait time. We don't get to sit around and not make any payments. We've got to make them. Well, folks, with that, now I'm just going to say we're going to lead up to post-confirmation, confirmation, all these things in Chapter 13 that are so different than Chapter 7. We're going to dig in. We're going to explain what that means. We're going to talk about how a Chapter 13 can proceed next time on The Legal Breakdown. Remember, you can always call in at 405-347-7238. You can ask your questions online through Facebook Live. It's been a great episode. I hope you found this informative. We will see you all next week. 